All right, good morning, everyone. Before we start, do you have any question? No, thanks. All right, good morning, everyone. Before we start, do you have any question? Good morning. Well, okay, now let's start. So last time uh, we were doing this real life applications. Um, we were modeling some real life problems using first order linear differential equations. Let's do one more example with that. Now we'll continue with uh, existence uniqueness uh, problems. Okay, we'll start in a minute. All right, so we continue to real life applications. So let's look at this problem. Uh, this is lecture four. So let's say we have 10 kilogram radioactive material and this is known to decay at a rate of proportional to the amount of amount present is known to decay at a rate of at the rate proportional to 
through the amount. Present. Okay. Well, uh, we know the half life. Uh, half life of this material. is 2000 years so that means so it comes to half life in 2000 years the case in this rate and the question is how much material will remain after six uh, six thousand uh, years how much material will remain after 6,000 years, okay? This is the question. So we will model this problem and then solve the differential equation corresponding to this problem. Let's do it. Uh, let's say Q of T here, it represents the amount uh, present. Okay? So the amount of uh, material present at time T. Now it says this amount decays here it decay at the rate of proportional to the amount present. That means basically the change in the amount here, Q, is proportional to the amount itself. The change is given by the derivative. So that means basically dQ dt, this is the change in the amount with respect to time, it's proportional to the amount Q. So that means there is a constant here K, or maybe let's put here C, okay, times Q of T. Here C is a constant. It's a negative constant, but we are not really interested in here because we will find it explicitly, okay. C is a constant. At the end, we will see that it's a negative constant because it the amount decays. That means the derivative is negative. Okay. All right. Let's um, try to solve it. Well, what are the initial conditions here? Um, at the beginning, we have. 10, kilo, 10 kilogram uh, radioactive. So that means uh, basically Q of zero at the beginning and time when T is equal to zero, we have 10 kilogram. Okay, so this is the initial value. So we have an initial value problem. <clears throat> we also know that half-life of the material is 2000 years. Well, this, we will need to find out C, okay? Uh, later we will use it, but let's first solve this initial value problem. It's an IVP and we will solve it, okay? But it's a simple IVP, um, it's, it's separable. So you can um, write it like this, dQ over Q is equal to C times dT, um, then integrate, basically, and we get simply what? Uh, ln q is equal to c times t. And from here, let's take the exponential of both sides. We get q of t is equal to q is equal to e to the 
Uh, I forgot the constant here. This is needed as well. CT plus K here, let's see. Okay. Now uh, we exponentiate both sides and we get E Q is equal to E to the C T times e to the k. Well, e to the k is another constant. So let's, instead of using e to the k, let's say this is equal to um, k tilde, another constant like this. All right. Uh, well, now we know that, basically we know the following. Uh, Q T is equal to E to the C T times a constant. Uh, okay, good. Uh, we will find out the C and K tilde. What is um, K tilde here? Well, to find out this, uh, we will plug zero here. Q zero is It's uh, e to the zero is one, so it is k tilde. At the same time, it is 10. So we find out that k tilde is 10. And we know the half-life. Half-life is uh, 2,000 years. That means uh, when it decays to five kilogram, um, this happens after 2,000 years. So um, q of two, thousand which is now we know k tilde k tilde is 10 times e to the c t oh t is 2000 sorry 2000 is equal to the half-life okay In the so this is equal to the half of the material so this is five, which gives basically um, C times 2000 is equal to logarithm one over two. Logarithm one over, one over two is basically minus ln two. So C is equal to minus ln two over 2000, okay? Now we know the other constant as well. So we can write the equation of um, the remaining material here after T time T. So Q of T is K tilde was 10 times E to the C times T minus ln two over 2000 times t, okay? Uh, you can simplify this, by the way, uh, because e to the ln two is, so this is like e to the ln two, two minus t over 2000, okay? But e to the ln two is two, so it is basically 10 times two to the minus t over 2,000, okay? So this is in a better form. The question was how much remains after 6,000 years? So Q of 6,000 is basically 10 times two to the minus three, okay, when t is 6,000, 6,000 or 2,000 is three. And so we get that. So basically this is 10 over eight kilogram remains after 6,000 years. All right, any question with this? Well, John, can you explain um, at the beginning why we 
say that uh, dq over dt equals c times q of t. Okay, Th that's the important part here. Um, it's given in the question, it says there's decay here. Okay, the decay is proportional to the amount present. That means decay means the change in the quantity, okay? Change in the amount, it's proportional to the amount. So this is the change, decay, okay? So this is the decay rate in Q. It's proportional to the amount. So this is the amount of the material, okay? So proportional means they are dependent to each other by a constant, okay? It's a multiple of the other one by a constant. So we have a constant C here, all right? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ajahn. Any other question? Okay, good. Let's um, move to now uh, another topic. So we'll talk about principle of uh, superposition. It's a simple thing, but let's talk about it first. What it is. So in, <clears throat> in these equations, our purpose is to find a solution at some point. Um, sometimes we get several solutions and then using the several solutions, we will get the general solution. <clears throat> and what you do is you combine this particular solutions to obtain a general solution. Um, well, and for this, we use this principle of superposition. It basically says um, uh, if you have solutions, then their combinations are also solutions. That there are some, you know, um, assumptions. Let's talk about this with details. Suppose that. We have F1, F2, Fn. These are solutions. Of the first order linear. or the like this y prime plus uh, px y is equal to q of x. So we have n many solutions of this uh, first order linear differential equation. Okay. Let's give a name for this star to refer later. Then any combination any combination. Are we say linear combination for this linear combination? Like this F is basically the sum of this functions with some constants, okay, as a coefficient. Ci f of i, i is from one to n. Here, what are ci? CIs are constants and 
they sum up to one, okay, where the CIs are constants and they sum up to one is also a solution of star, okay? So we have a requirement here, the, the, co the coefficients, okay, the constants, they must, they must sum up to one, okay, to get a solution, another solution of this star. Uh, we have more than that, moreover, if star is homogeneous, well, homogeneous here is different from the one we talked about last time, okay? So that means basically Q of X is equal to zero, okay? When the right-hand side of the OD is zero, then we say um, the equation is homogeneous equation. There is another uh, way to define, way to talk about this homogeneous thing, right? We, we say, if the right hand side depends on y over x only, we say also homogeneous, but that's different. Okay, that's a different thing. So in this context, context here, um, that means basically q of x is zero. If this is zero, then any combination without any conditions on CI now I is from one to n is a solution to start here CIs are any real numbers we don't need we don't need such a requirement when the equation is a homogeneous equation okay so. where ci's are any uh, constants All right. So in the case of homogeneous equation, um, we don't even need that. The CIs can be any real number and we get a solution in this case. Well, this is easy to show. Let's maybe show this quickly. Let's prove this proof. So basically we start with some solutions here. We say we have the solutions and using this, we will show that this one is a solution as well, okay? So F is the combination and we will show that it is a solution of the OD as well star. Let's look at, to check that this is a solution, we will, we will check whether this satisfies here, this satisfies this equation, okay? We will check that whether this function satisfies this equation. So let's put this in star. Instead of y, we will put f, okay? So let's check out um, f prime plus p of x, times F and let's see what we get. Well, this, so we take the derivative of F, F is given by the finite number of uh, Fi's here, the sum of finite number of Fi's. So uh, we differentiate uh, 
each of them and we get the following the sum of ci fi prime i is from one to uh, n okay plus p of x times f f is again the sum so it's going to be uh, ci times p of x times f of i i is from one to n Okay, there are two good questions. One is uh, why, okay, why do we have, so we say that CIs are, the, the sum of CIs are one, right? So, but it doesn't cancel out in this sum, okay? It doesn't, because you cannot separate this with sum of CI time. It's not equal to, this is not two. Okay, we don't have anything like this. That's why uh, we need to write CIs, okay? All right, the other question is um, another good question, which says, uh, there are different solutions here. That means it is not an initial value problem. That's correct. Uh, it's not initial, it's an OD, but we don't have any initial conditions. So that means we have infinitely many solutions usually, okay? All right. Um, so let's continue with this. We just put this F in star here, okay? And we get this, but now, we know that FIs are the solutions, so we can first write it like this. We can write in one sum, in one sum, it's CI parentheses. We have FI prime plus P of X times F of F sub I, I is from one to N, okay? Well, since fi's are solutions, that means f i prime plus px fi, this is equal to q of x, okay? Equal to q of x since fi's are the solutions of star, okay? Since we have this, it's equal to q of x, Q of X is independent of I, so you can take it out of the sum and that becomes basically Q of X times CI. But we assume that this is basically one, okay? So at the end, you get Q of X. And this tells you that F is a solution of the star, right? So that means basically F. Remember star here above, okay? So F is a solution. So star. All right, we did, but we, we are done with this first part. The second part is similar. Um, it says if Q of X is zero, um, then you don't need this requirement on CI because Q of X will be zero. Um, this inside of the sum here, when Q of X is equal to zero, when the equation is homogeneous, the whole thing will be zero okay so on the on the right hand side you will get zero and it's going to be the solution of the star again so i will skip that part because it's basically the same the second part of the proof uh, the second 
part of the proof is similar. So I will skip this. Okay. Any question so far? So what we learned here is uh, when we have in the homogeneous case, let's consider the homogeneous case, that means Q of X is equal to zero. In that case, um, any linear combination of solutions will be a solution, okay? Yeah, we will use this later, this fact. Well, let's now talk about existence uniqueness theorems. So this is chapter uh, 2.4 in the book. Now we are interested in the solutions of um, differential equations. Um, we would like to know whether they exist. And if they exist, uh, like to know whether they are unique solutions. Uh, we can do this by solving explicitly, but sometimes they are not easy to solve um, or they're, you know, they're impossible to solve but you still know how to, you still know whether they, there exist solutions, okay, by this theorems. So basically without solving it, we would like to know whether there's a solution or not, and whether the solution is unique or not, okay. The first one is here for linear, first order linear ODE, existence uniqueness theorem for first order linear ODE. Okay. Well, in this case, uh, we have the initial value problem. The initial value problem, which is y prime plus p of t times y is equal to q of t. Initial value is, let's say at t zero, it's equal to y zero. This has a unique solution. Unique solution. If the coefficient here p and the non homogeneous term here q, p, t, and q, t, these are continuous. On an interval. around this T zero interval I containing T zero. Okay, so T zero is here. The initial value is given at T zero. Okay, at this point. At this point, near this point, if P and Q are continuous, then there is a unique solution. Okay, so we have like this, there is here T zero and around this T zero, we have an interval like this I So this is the interval, okay I and if P and Q have If P and Q are continuous on this interval, then there is a solution on this interval, okay? Okay. 
Okay, there was one question. How do we uh, split the sum in the previous proof? Let's go back here. I guess you're talking about this, okay. Uh, and this here. Well, FIs are the solutions. That means this part here gives you Q, right? It's like sum of CI times Q of X, okay? I is from one to N, but Q of X, it doesn't depend on the index. I is the index, I will change, okay? And you can take this out of the sum and it becomes Q of X times CI, okay? But this is, we assume that this is equal to one. So we end up with Q, Q of X, okay? Clear now? Great. All right, let's go to this important theorem, which says basically in the first order linear ODE, if P and Q are continuous, then uh, we have a solution uh, where they are continuous. Um, the proof. The proof is simple because uh, we already know that, remember <clears throat> integrating factors, we solve this first order linear OD using integrating factor. And it, the solution was given by this Y of T is mu of T integrate mu of T Q of T dt. Here, what is mu of T? Where mu of T is e to the integral P of T dt. Okay, that was the integrating, is the integrating factor. So let's first talk about the existence of the solution. So this says basically you can find a solution like this, but the thing is this integral here, is it here, does it exist? That's the question, okay? Because not all functions are integrable. Sometimes you cannot integrate. Um, there is no integral of the function, but if you know that, inside the integral, the integral is continuous, then you can integrate the function. Continuous functions are integrable, okay? And here we assume that um, Q of T is continuous, P of T is continuous. Then since P of T is continuous, mu is well-defined because you can integrate P of T, okay? Um, since, P T is continuous. This integral exists, okay? Hence, mu T, mu T here exists. And continuous. Mu T is continuous and it's, it exists and it's, con it's continuous. Well, now mu T is continuous and Q T is continuous. So Y T exists, right? Then integral mu T Q 
QT, DT exists. Thus, YT exists. Okay. So we basically show the existence of the solution using integrating factor. Now, what about the uniqueness part? So we have a solution from this integral. There are many solutions, right? Because we have a constant, free constant. So let's say, uh, for instance, let's call this here f of t. It's a function of t, OK? Let's call it f of t. So. Now we are looking at the uniqueness part. Part of the proof. Y of T is equal to this integral here. When you integrate, you get an, uh, you get an antiderivative F of T plus a constant. Okay, so it's like this F of T plus a constant over mu of t, right? In this form, we have many solutions here. C is any real number. And you can choose any C and you get a solution. But we have an initial condition, which says at t0, we have y0. So at t0, y t0 is equal to f of t0 plus c over mu of t0. This is equal to y sub 0. And from here, you get that c is equal to mu of t0 y0 minus f of t0. So this determine C uniquely, right? There is only one such C and thus C is unique, constant and Y is the unique solution. Of the OD star, okay. So here we established the uniqueness part as well by using the initial value and we are done. So basically what we learned here is when you have a first order linear OD with um, continuous coefficients, then you have a unique solution. Maybe let's do one, one example, simple example like that. find the largest interval on which the initial value problem given by this four minus t squared y prime minus two y is equal to arc tangent t. The initial value is at minus one, y is equal to three. To show that this, find the largest interval on which this IVP 
has a unique solution. Okay, so we will find the interval on which interval for t, okay, on which this initial value problem has unique solution. Well, first of all, let's write this like in the form of first order linear differential equation. So we will write it like this, y prime minus two t over four minus t squared y is equal to arc tangent t over four minus t squared. In this form, it's a linear ODE, first order linear ODE, and this is my t of t. It's non-homogeneous because right hand side is non-zero, q of t, okay? So this is a first order linear non-homogeneous because Q is not zero, okay? Non-homogeneous, that means Q of T is not zero equation, differential equation, okay? And the theorem says if P and Q are continuous on an interval, then there is a unique solution uh, on this interval. The initial value is what? Initial value here is um, this. So around minus one, we will find an interval where these functions are continuous, okay? Okay, there is one question here. Maybe let's first do this example, then I will go back to the proof, okay? Um, so here we will find the largest interval around t is equal to minus one on which p and q are continuous, okay? They are both continuous functions. So what are the discontinuity points here? for P and Q. Oh, the question is why this is non-homogeneous because we say that when right hand side of the equation is non-zero, we say it is a non-homogeneous uh, equation, okay? All right, so let's um, look at this real line here, we have basically minus one here. Around minus one, we will find an interval where these two functions are continuous. The problem points are, well, Q and T, Q and P here. Arctangent is continuous everywhere, okay? So the only problem is when the denominator is zero here. These are discontinuous at t is equal to plus minus two, right? When four minus t squared is equal to zero. Well, minus two is here, two is here, okay? So that means basically you can go from minus two to two here containing minus one. So this is the largest in interval, um, right?
around minus one on which these two functions are continuous. So, by existence uniqueness theorem, this ODE here, let's call it star here, okay? Star has a unique solution on the interval i, which is minus two to two. Any question? All right, let's see here. So let me explain the thing and the proof here. There was one question. Ah, here, I guess. Oh, well, this part. We say since P of T is continuous, integral exists. Well, this actually follows from um, Fundamental theorem of calculus, it follows from calculus. Remember that if you have a continuous function, then there is an antiderivative of this function. Uh, it was fundamental theorem. That's why we have here, this exists, okay? Antiderivative exists because P is continuous, okay? Then let's look at mu of T. So in mu of T here, we have this one, but we know that it exists. There is an antiderivative. So this integral exists. So it exponential e to the something, mu is equal e to the something. So mu exists, okay. Um, fundamental theorem also says that this antiderivative is actually differentiable. So it's continuous, okay. So mu of t is also continuous because integral of p is continuous. Uh, that's why we have this, okay? So basically we use the fact that continuous functions are integrable in this proof. All right, any other question or comment? Okay, let's give a break here uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, so let's meet at nine 9.45, let's see. Uh, okay, there is one more question here. Maybe let's point out this one as well. Ah, uh, here. Yeah, maybe you're right. Here we say the whole thing is f of t. Um, maybe I should say here instead of that f of t is an antiderivative of mu times q, okay? It's an antiderivative of mu, so this integral here represents the family of antiderivative. That's why we have plus c, right? That was the question. So if you say this f, does how how does it become f plus c? Well, f of t is an antiderivative. It's a particular antiderivative, one of those, and this integral represents the family of antiderivatives. So you add a constant to f of t to get this family. Okay. All right, um, see you at 
Okay, so let's um, continue with another existence uniqueness theorem, the more general one. Do we have any question before we continue? Well, remember the existence uniqueness theorem here. Uh, that was for first order linear ODs. Now we have uh, now we have the existence uniqueness theorem for nonlinear first order uh, OD. This is existence uniqueness. for non-linear first order differential equations, ordinary differential equations, okay? Well, what it says basically a similar statement, but now let's say we have, so we consider the initial value problem, consider the IVP given by this dy dt is some function on the right hand side FTY here y t0 is equal to initial value is given by this so supposing that this capital F and its derivative with respect to Y are continuous, then we have a solution. So basically we have the following. Suppose that this function, it's a function of two variables, okay? So uh, now the continuity means continuous with respect to both variable, okay? so. Um, FTY and its partial derivative with respect to Y. These are functions and they are continuous on a rectangle. containing this point, T0, Y0, okay? So remember T0, Y0 are the initial conditions here, initial condition here at T0, it's equal to Y0, okay? So initial conditions is given at this point, T0, Y0. Um, containing the point, let's say the point So around this point on a rectangle, um, this functions are continuous, then the IVP has a unique solution. Unique solution around this point, T0, Y0, around the point, let's say, okay. So this is the statement of 
uh, uniqueness, existence uniqueness theorem, uh, when we have nonlinear equation, in that case, we look at the uh, right hand side and it's derivative with respect to y near uh, the initial value. Okay. So, near the initial value, if these functions are continuous, then uh, the initial value problem is a unique solution around the point. Well, let me draw a picture for this. Um, so let's say we have this point here, T0, Y0. So around this, there is a rectangle means the following. We have a rectangle like this, okay? And in this rectangle, um, those two functions are continuous, okay? So here, um, F and derivative of F with respect to Y continues. Then um, the IVP has a solution um, inside this rectangle, um, not in the whole rectangle. It might be a smaller, there is maybe a smaller rectangle like this. And on the smaller rectangle, there is a solution, okay? There is a unique solution to I, V, P, okay? The theorem says this. Right, right. So there's one comment here. Since we have two variables, um, we talk about the rectangles instead of intervals, right? Well, the nice thing is this actually, um, well, we will not prove it. The proof is very complicated, okay? The proof of this, this theorem is not simple like in the previous one. So we will skip the proof. Um, it uses some advanced techniques from functional analysis. Um, okay, so this is like a fixed point theorem and so on. So we will not go into that. But what you can realize is this theorem implies the previous one, okay? The previous theorem, remember, was uh, for uh, first order linear uh, differential equation. And this is more general than that. And it implies the previous one. Let me show it. How does one imply the previous one? Well, there is one uh, question. So why do we take a rectangle instead of a circle? The reason is um, a rectangle, you can write it like this, for instance, this here is like uh, T zero minus some number delta, T zero plus some number delta, okay? And you uh, uh, cross this with, uh, another vertical interval, like CD, okay? Um, so when we check the solutions, we look at the interval around T0, and when you use the interval around T0, we get a rectangle, not a, not a circle, okay? But basically, if there is a solution around this point in a rectangle, you can draw a small circle, uh, disk and in this disk there is a solution as well because you can always find a small disk inside the rectangle but this is the most general um, uh, region where the uh, solution exists okay um, oh there is another question why do we take derivative respect to why that's not trivial it's not something you can explain easily, okay? You can consider this a black box. But at least um, let's see what we get. Maybe you, this will explain why we get the derivative with respect to y. Let's consider the linear 
first order linear differential equation. So let's write this as a remark. This theorem implies the previous one. So let's consider in the previous one, we had some like this dy dt is equal to q of t minus, let's put uh, this term to the right hand side, minus y times p of t, right? This is the first order uh, linear OD. You can say this, the whole thing here is a function of T and Y, okay? Like in the second theorem, this one, like this one, okay? Well, now what is the derivative of capital F with respect to Y? then derivative of capital F with respect to Y is basically minus P of T, right? So yes, If P of T and Q of T are continuous, then what? P and Q are continuous means partial derivative of F and F itself, they are continuous, okay? Then this because it's basically minus P. So P is continuous, minus P is also continuous, okay? This is minus P. And F, F is basically Q minus Y times P. Since P and Q are continuous, Y is also continuous. And we get uh, Q minus Y times P is also, continues continues okay and by the second theorem we say that this od has a solution okay by second theorem OD has a solution. The initial value problem has a solution. So you see here, this maybe explains why we take the derivative with respect to Y because um, this returns this problem as in the first one, the linear case, okay? Uh, when you take the derivative with respect to Y, you get P here minus p here, okay? All right, any other question or comment? Let's do one example with that. In the nonlinear case.
all right, let's find, or maybe it's okay to do this one. So consider this. Y prime is equal to um, Y to the one over three. Okay, so this is a nonlinear, nonlinear, non first order OD. Okay. Oh, uh, in the previous one, uh, the solution here is not unique because initial value is not given. If you plug, maybe let's plug initial value, then it becomes better. There is a question, is the solution unique in the previous one? The theorem says it is unique because we have initial value, okay? Um, so it's a unique solution. In the remark, we didn't put any initial value. So maybe let's put here y t0 is equal to some number y0. In that case, we have um, as a unique solution, okay? It's a unique solution. Okay. Without the initial value, it's not a unique solution. With the initial value theorem says it's a unique solution. Now we consider this differential equation. And um, the, the first question is this is there a unique solution? Unique means there is only one solution, okay, to the initial value problem with y0 is equal to one near the point zero one, okay? Do we have a solution near this point? Unique solution. What do you say, do we? Well, Okay, uh, so we will look at this, right? This is my equation. Y prime is equal to Y to the one over three. And this is my F of, um, let's, let's say the, var the variable is T uh, and Y, okay? F of T, Y. And the point is zero, one at y is equal to one at zero, okay? When t is zero. So um, we need to check f of t. f of t is continuous, okay? And it's derivative with respect to y. So f of t y, which is y to the one over three is continuous everywhere. What about the derivative? F sub y, derivative of f with respect to y, it's one over three times y to the minus two over three. Or you can write like this one over three y squared y to the two over three. Well, this is not 
it's not even defined at zero. At zero, right? This is not defined, so it's not continuous at zero. Um, this function is discontinuous at y is equal to zero only. Otherwise, it's continuous. But the nice thing is we are looking for the solution nearby zero, zero comma one, right? So that means near this point, y is equal to one. So we are looking at the solutions near one when y is equal to one. So near one, this function is continuous, right? Near the point. zero one be careful here y is one x t is zero okay y is not zero y is one okay so this is the y component this is the t component okay so near this point f sub y which is one over three y to the two third is continuous It's continuous. Then the theorem, the previous theorem says what? There is a solution, unique solution to this initial value problem near this point. So by previous theorem, there exists a unique solution to this IVP, okay? So we check F and its derivative respect to Y and they're both continuous near this point. Uh, initial value, okay? And then um, we have a unique solution. Let me give an exercise for you. Find this unique solution, okay? It's an, ex you can find it in this equation because it's a separable equation. So you can do it easily. Um, find the unique solution. Solution here. Okay. You can try this yourself. You will simply try to solve this, and it's acceptable, so you can do it easily. Yeah, there is one solution given here. Is it three quarter y to the four third? I guess it is y to the, huh. No, it's not. It should be something like this. Maybe let me write the answer here. Check this yourself. Y is like um,
this should be the answer. Okay, check this yourself. Yeah, that's uh, that. There are two good questions here. Um, right. If if y is equal to zero at some point t, then there is. Well, we cannot say that there is no solution. This is one way theorem, okay? But we we can say that if y is equal to zero at some point t. In that case, we cannot use the theorem, okay? So in that case, there may or there, there may not be a solution, but theorem doesn't guarantee the solution if y is equal to zero. Uh, another question is, um, does that mean that everywhere except y is equal to zero, there is a unique solution? That's right. Whenever y is different from zero, near that point, there is a unique solution, right? Here, one is an example, okay? But you can take any number different from zero and there is a unique solution nearby that point, right? Um, let's do um, a similar example. The same differential equation with different initial conditions. So we consider this now y prime, it was y to the, one over three. Now the initial conditions are, um, let's take y zero is equal to zero now, okay? It's not one, but zero. The question is, um, is there a unique solution? to IVP near the point origin. Now the point is zero, zero. So near this point, do we have a unique solution? Well, again, this is the same equation, um, F of, solution f of x y is y to the one over three we don't have any problem with that it is continuous everywhere okay is continuous fine All right, what about the derivative? F sub y, it's uh, one over three, two, y to the two third. Now this is not continuous at zero, is not continuous at y is equal to zero. That means we cannot apply the existence uniqueness theorem. Okay, so, um, so we cannot apply existence uniqueness theorem. That means there may be a solution or there may not be a solution. The solution can be unique or not, okay? So this is not known yet. Let's try to solve it and see what we get, okay? So 
let's try to solve um let's call it star here okay star so we will try to solve this Well, the equation is dy over dx or dy over dt. So, right, so this is um, dy over y to the one over three is equal to um, dx let's say and you integrate all right well left hand side is basically y to the minus one over three so it's going to be uh y to the two over three um three over two is equal to x plus a constant c let's say x or t maybe let's use t because earlier we say it's t it doesn't make too much difference but let's be consistent here t plus c okay so from here uh we can find the initial value um when t is zero y is equal to zero so okay we said x above anyway x t okay uh, it doesn't make too much difference but yeah. when t is equal to zero uh y is equal to zero so um we get zero is equal to zero plus c so that means basically c is equal to zero okay so let's see what we get so y is equal to from here y is equal to two over three t to the um three half but this is plus minus okay plus minus so you see there are at least there are two solutions and both satisfies the initial conditions so these are two solutions to the initial value problem Okay, so th there is a solution, but it's not unique here. Okay, no unique solution here. Well, you can even get more solutions. Um, for instance, y is equal to identically zero, zero function. This is zero at zero. And if you go back to the equation, derivative of y, derivative of zero here, okay, is equal to zero. So it is also a solution of the uh, star trivial solution is also a solution of star. So here we see at least there are three solutions. So the solution is not unique. Okay. Yes. the IVP star 
doesn't have a unique solution. Okay. So in this case, uh, when y is equal to zero, we cannot apply the theorem. So the theorem doesn't guarantee the uniqueness of the solution. And actually we said that, we see that here, we saw that here, there are many solutions. There are at least three solutions There can be more than this. Okay. Um, so the uniqueness fails in this example. Uh, any question, any comment here? John, when we were taking the partial derivative with respect to y, um, mm -hmm. can you show that part again? Um, you mean this? Yes. Uh, well, here, this is my f, right? It's a function of x and y. Uh, oh, wait, wait, we said here X and we said T here. Maybe we should write everything in. Um, anyway, I will correct this later, but um, so this is a function of X and Y and we differentiate this with respect to Y. Basically you differentiate this, oops, sorry. Uh, you differentiate this function with respect to y, y is the variable, okay? So what is the derivative of this? One third comes from y to the one third minus one, okay? This is it. Oh, wait, did I do wrong? This is, should be one third, yeah. Maybe you're right. This, but it doesn't change anything, but this should be here, okay? Yeah, there is a small mistake here. It should be one third, not one half, but that doesn't change anything. When we take the derivative, it becomes this. So it is one third y to the minus two over three. Okay. Um, maybe I should, anyway, t is equal to x, okay? Replace, uh, okay. Maybe I should change everywhere here with t with x. because we use X here, not T. In the previous one. Right, so. This should be X, this should be X. Yeah, I guess that's it. All right, there is another question. Um, Uh, I couldn't catch the difference between the problem one and two. Uh, the one we have a unique solution. Okay, right. In in problem one, initial condition is given by this y zero is equal to one. Okay, so this is the x coordinate. This is the y coordinate. Okay, so near the y coordinate, y is equal to one. This function f sub y is continuous because it it's not defined at zero when y is equal to zero other than that so this f sub y is continuous that's why we have a unique solution in the second question the condition is this this is the x coordinate this is the y coordinate okay now with this condition initial condition when y is equal to zero, 
the derivative here, this function is not continuous at the initial condition, y is equal to zero. That's why we cannot apply the theorem. And actually we have many solutions here. The solution is not unique, okay? So the difference between two problems is the initial condition, okay? In the first one, the derivative with respect to y is continuous. In the second one, the derivative with respect to y is not continuous. Uh, no, in the first one, it's not con it's continuous, right? In the second one, it's not continuous uh, at the initial condition, okay? All right, is it clear now? Any other question or comment? Okay, we will stop now. Uh, I will see you uh, next uh, Tuesday. And we will continue with some other type of differential equations and we will solve it, okay? We will find the solutions. So if you don't have any other uh, question, we will stop now. All right, see you next week. Have a good uh, weekend. Bye. Uh, I'm not in the office right now. Um, so today I will not be in the office, but you can come next Monday. Monday I will be, okay? If you have any question, you can come and ask your questions on Monday or Tuesday at the office hour.